today. If you have a Bible, open it to 1 Timothy chapter 4. I want to open up an important text here at the end of 1 Timothy chapter 4 with you and cast some light on it from a prior text in 1 Timothy chapter 3. First, let me say what I always feel compelled to say when I walk back into this place. I, I thank God for Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. Dr. Greenway, I appreciate your leadership, pray for you, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to preach in chapel today. God called me to preach just as I was finishing high school, and he has blessed me in so many ways, and one of the chief aspects of that blessing was the opportunity to experience a theological education here at Southwestern Seminary. I, I, uh, I feel the benefit of that education more and more the older I get, and I'm grateful to God for the tools for ministry that, uh, that he gave me here, and grateful for this institution. By the way, if you're a student here, I, I, I feel led to tell you, when I was a student here, I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. And so take heart. You know, my, neither of my parents had ever been to college. Nobody in my family was a, was a pastor or a minister or a missionary. And uh, all I did was uh, say yes to every opportunity that came my way and try to follow the Lord one step at a time. And he has been faithful to bless and protect and use me down through the years. And I know that he'll do the same for you. You know, oftentimes the Old Testament prophets spoke of their vision as their burden. Sometimes we think about vision as being able to see something that ought to be. But the Bible also teaches us that sometimes our vision is our burden. Maybe what things ought not to be. And the burden that brings me to Guidestone is a burden for so many of our pastors and ministers who just don't do very well. In fact, I want to see every servant of Christ finish well. And I believe that's central to the mission of Guidestone. Our little part of that work is to enhance financial security and well-being for those who are serving Christ. But financial security is just one part of that larger picture. And to finish well, you've got to start well. You've got to stay well. You've got to be well. You've got to serve well. When a minister of the gospel finishes well, it honors Christ and it helps to advance the gospel. And uh, we want to see that to be the rule and not the exception. And there's one verse that God has used to, uh, to bring that burden to my heart. And, and it's a verse I want to unpack with you today. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. I read out of the New American Standard, which actually, uh, in my opinion, this is one of the rare cases where the New American Standard doesn't do a great job at, with this text. Uh, but look at verse 16 of verse 4. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. That is actually the definite article there. To yourself and to the teaching, to the doctrine. Persevere in these things. For as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. Three verbs here in this verse, pay attention, persevere, save. Those are three great verbs, aren't they? By the way, young preacher, if you want to preach a good sermon, choose a text with good verbs. All right? Pay attention, persevere, save. And so my message from this text this morning is get focused and stay focused because your ministry has eternal consequences. This is Paul's conviction and it should be ours. First of all, get focused. Paul says to Timothy, pay close attention 
to yourself and to the doctrine. And, and this is, in many ways, is a summation of, of all of the pastoral epistles, right? Uh, this, this is what Paul is talking to Timothy about. Pay close attention to yourself and to the doctrine. Pay close attention. Hold your mind on. Pay attention. Focus on yourself and on the doctrine. I, I, I picked up a copy of the book I'd never read before uh, about the ship Endurance and Sir Ernest Shackleton's uh, attempt at that famous uh, trans-Antarctic expedition. Remember, they just recently they found the wreckage of the ship. And so I thought, well, I've never read that story. I picked it up. I'm about three-quarters of the way three-fourths of the way finished with the book, but the ship, the ship gets stuck between two huge flows of ice and eventually it's crushed and Shackleton and the 28 men that are with him realize we, we're not going to make this journey by ship. We're going to have to go by foot across the ice to try to find some civilization so that we might be rescued. And originally, and it didn't turn out this way, but originally their plan was to go by foot for about 246 miles to a settlement where they thought if they were patient enough, somebody would come by and help them. And Shackleton knew they could not carry much weight on that journey. And so he challenged them to get rid of everything they absolutely did not need. In fact, he said, you can only carry two pounds of personal items and one pound of tobacco. Uh, also two pairs of socks and two mittens. And, and pairs of mittens. And then leading by example, Shackleton pulls out of his pocket a gold cigarette case, throws it down on the snow. Pulls out of his pocket several gold coins, throws them down on the snow. They're worthless. All the rest of his baggage is out there. And then he pulls out a Bible that the queen mother had given him when they left on the journey. He tore out the inscription page where she had signed the Bible. He tore out the 23rd Psalm threw the rest of the Bible on the, on the ground. Now, I'm not suggesting that. We, we need the whole counsel of God's word. Uh, I have to make that point in this audience. But it is a great example of focus, right? Shackleton knew we can't be weighed down by anything that's non-essential. Well, the Apostle Paul says to Timothy and to all of us who are ministers of the gospel, is you must pay attention to the essentials. And he identifies the essentials as the doctrine and yourself. If you are going to be effective fulfilling the calling on your life through Christ Jesus our Lord, then you must pay attention to the doctrine and to yourself. I, I, I'm going to spend most of my time talking about paying attention to yourself. But let me be careful to say we must pay attention to the doctrine, the gospel, the word, the scriptures. The ministry of the gospel is a ministry of the word. And in all that a busy pastor or missionary or servant of Christ does, it's important that we focus on the ministry of the word. Not just holding the doctrine, but sharing the doctrine, right? Not, not just keeping our doctrine straight, but actively participating in an effective teaching and preaching ministry. Evangelism, proclamation, teaching, discipleship. Pay careful attention to the word. If your ministry is not a ministry of the word, then you're not sowing any seed, right? And you'll be wholly unproductive. So focus on the doctrine and Pay careful attention to yourself, to your person, your character, to, to use the old King James language, to all of your conversation, your way of life. Pay careful attention to yourself. Some of you, I, I know in this audience, are familiar with Richard Baxter's famous book about being a pastor, the Reformed Pastor. It's a book that everybody in this room should be familiar with. Uh, Baxter was born in 1615, and that book 
is exceedingly influential and, and uh, uh, reformed, the reformed pastor, the word reformed there in that day is not used in a sense of Calvinistic doctrine. It's used in a sense of a renewed pastor, a pastor with a renewed, vital, fresh engagement of the work. And in his large book about what it means to be an effective pastor, Baxter just has three sections. And the third section is an application of the first two. The second section is titled The Oversight of the Flock. But the first large section is titled The Oversight of Yourself. The Oversight of Ourselves. Well, Baxter had read the book, hadn't he? He had read Acts chapter 20, verse 28. He had read texts like this. He understood that if you're going to shepherd the flock, then you must be a good example for them. He understood that the calling is a calling not just to be the shepherd of the flock, but to oversee yourself. Paul here says, if you're going to be effective in the call, then you must be focused, give careful attention to the doctrine and to yourself. Can I tell you 30 years of pastoral ministry? I've seen a few men disqualify themselves. Because of doctrinal error, because they weren't paying attention to the teaching. But I've seen a lot more of them disqualify themselves because they weren't paying attention to themselves. And when I meditate on this text and think about what, what was Paul, what did Paul have in mind when he said, pay attention to yourself? I, I learned here at Southwestern to interpret scripture by scripture, right? It, 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 in fact, I, I was three days, three class section into my sessions into my hermeneutics course before I knew what the word hermeneutics meant. And, and so I think the best way to understand what Paul means when he says pay attention to yourself is to consider this letter, 1 Timothy. And maybe the best place in 1 Timothy to get a grasp of it is in his qualification statement of chap, chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. Paul tells us what he means when he says you've got to pay attention to yourself. When he sets out these qualifications. In fact, let's just take a little bit of time and, and read across the page 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. This is what Paul says we should expect of ourselves. And, and listen, these are qualifications for the office of overseer, but I don't care what type of Christian ministry you're going to embrace whether it's pastoring a church or serving in some other capacity. And these qualifications are focused on men serving as overseers of the local fellowship, but there are qualification statements here that apply to men and women. What does it mean to be an effective servant of Christ Jesus? What does it mean to pay attention to yourself? Look what he says. It is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. An overseer then must be. Let me just stop there and make sure you notice something. In Paul's mind, you have the office, you have the work, you have the person. The office of the overseer, a fine work to do, you must be. And your calling is not just to an office, it's to a work. You can't do the work to which you're called if you're not the man and woman that God has called you to be. You must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, a fighter, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. It must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? I love how in Paul's mind, to manage is to take care of. To manage is to take care of. And not a new convert, 
that he will not become conceited and fall into condemnation incurred by the devil, and he must have a good reputation with those outside the church so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. We don't have time to go into all that. But I would sum up this qualification statement with two words, reputation and relationships. What does Paul mean when he says, pay careful attention to yourself, keep an eye on your reputation, your character, your integrity? Keep an eye on your relationships, starting with the relationships at home. I, I was sharing this text with a group of pastors last week, and we had a Q&A at the end of that, and one of the young pastors asked the question, well, how, how practically do we keep a watch? What's that look like practically? How do we keep a watch over ourselves? And you can answer that question in a lot of ways, but there are two kind of uh, metaphors that come to my mind the man or woman of God are trying to serve the Lord if, and pay attention to themselves are going to be concerned, first of all, about margin. You know, a margin is a border, a space, amount of amount that's, that's allowed or available beyond what is assumed to be necessary. To, keep an, to pay attention to yourself means I'm going to live my life with some margin. The other is that great concept of concentric circles, which a great Southwesterner, Oscar Thompson, made famous, but the concentric circles. We see this come to play even here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, that if I'm going to be sound on the edges with my neighbor, with the nations, with the people I'm trying to reach with the gospel, then I have to be sound relationally all the way to the core. My relationship with God in Christ Jesus, my relationship with myself, my relationship with my, my wife and my children, my extended family. Because ruptured relationships at the core become rotten relationships that sour an entire ministry. And so listen, for the servant of Christ, self-care is not selfish. An athlete takes care of his body. A musician takes care of his instrument. If you're called to be a minister of the gospel, then you're called to take care of yourself. To pay careful attention spiritually, emotionally, relationally, Pay attention to yourself. So get focused. And then the second verb, stay focused over the long haul. Persevere in these things, Paul says. Uh, to, literally, st to stay after it over the long haul to continue in the pursuit of, of getting the doctrine right and keeping yourself right. To start well and stay well and finish well. It's interesting to me as I study and meditate on 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 7, that Paul is assuming that the overseer is going to live and serve under pressure, under the microscope, and under attack. That's a whole other sermon. If you'll invite me back, I'll preach that one. So we're, we're not living out our calling in a neutral, easy environment. We're living out our calling in a hostile environment, constantly under pressure, under the microscope, and under attack. Isn't it interesting that when Paul thinks about the qualifications for a local church leader, his mind turns to Satan? He, he speaks about the devil not once but twice in his qualification statement. He's saying the reason you have to be so careful about your integrity and about your relationships is because you have an enemy. And as you're serving, he's going to try to exploit ruptured relationships. He's going to try to corrupt your integrity. He's going to use your pride against you. And so get focused, but then stay focused because this is a long, hard race that you're running. You ever, have you ever been to a tractor pull? I, I know that not everyone benefits from the high culture that I've 
benefited from growing up in Oklahoma. But watch one on television sometime. And what's fascinating about these big tractor pulls is these tractors are pulling these sleds across the dirt. The sleds are very sophisticated and, and they're crafted in such a way that the, the longer the tractor pulls the sled, the weight adjusts, the sled becomes heavier and heavier. And in a sense, that's a metaphor for ministry. I know that as a student, you're thinking, I've got so many time demands, there's so much going on in my life, I've got to read these many books. I, it's, when, and when I get to seminary, things are going to get easier. Can I tell you, it's going to get heavier and heavier and heavier. And, and, and so that's why P Paul is saying, get focused and then stay focused, persevere in these things. Start well, stay well, finish well, healthy, sound. By the way, that's another key word for Paul in the pastorals, isn't it? To be healthy, to be sound in doctrine and in person from the center out with margins in life. Start, stay, get focused, stay focused. Because your ministry has eternal consequences. The souls of men depend on you. I believe Paul is intentionally provocative in verse 16. He knows what he's doing to us when he writes, for as you do this, you will... You will save both yourself and those who hear you. That's what he says, literally. Get focused on yourself and on the doctrine. Persevere in living as an example and teaching and preaching the doctrine because as you do this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. That's a provocative statement, isn't it? Paul wants us to set up and think carefully. And obviously, when we interpret that verse in the context of the whole counsel of the word, we know that his primary purpose here is not soteriology. He's not trying to teach us about the doctrine of salvation. But clearly, isn't he? He's using provocative language to make us think about the fact that we are dealing with the souls of people. We are handling the message of the gospel. People are depending on us to speak the truth of the gospel to them today and tomorrow and as long as the Lord Jesus tarries. So our calling is a high calling. Our burden is a heavy burden. We're dealing with eternal matters that deserve our full attention and should not be dealt with it casually. I had a little bit of a medical procedure last week. It wasn't anything serious, but it required them to uh, put me under anesthetic. So I checked in early and the, and the admitting nurse asked me a series of questions about, about my diet, about allergies, about if I'd ever had a response to anesthetic. And she asked me probably eight different questions. I answered them. They put me back in the booth in a little room, you know, I gowned up and the surgical nurse comes in. She asked me the same questions. What did, what did I have to eat? Do I have any allergies? Have I ever been under anesthetic before? Da, 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 da. She went down the list. I answered them. Ten minutes later, the anesthesiologist comes in. She asks the same questions. And finally, as they're wheeling me into the procedure, the doctor comes in. What do you think he does? He asks me the same questions. But I wasn't frustrated by that because you know what I understood? These people know my life is in their hands. And so... They are so serious about my well-being 
that they've created these redundancies of patterns to make sure that they don't make any mistake, that they don't miss anything. Because what they're doing is serious work. Tell me who's doing more serious work than we are. But so often we are just stumbling and blundering through it. And not only careless with the doctrine, our teaching and preaching ministry, but careless when it comes to our way of life. Paul says, the soul's of men and women are depending on you. Get focused. Stay focused because your work has eternal consequences. Let's pray together.